Buried deep in North America is a body of water so vast it holds a tenth of the planet's surface fresh water. Spanning 82,000 square kilometers, it dwarfs entire countries and commands its own weather. This is not just a lake, it is the raw engine at the heart of a continent. But what ancient cataclysms forged its basin of volcanic stone and towering glacial cliffs? The answer will redefine what you thought was possible in Earth's geography. From the heart of North America, a freshwater expanse stretches farther than the eye can trace. 82,000 square kilometers, its reach eclipsing the entire country of Austria. This is not a lake in the ordinary sense. Its surface holds three quadrillion gallons of water, enough to cover both North and South America in a layer nearly a foot deep. Lake Superior contains more water than all the other Great Lakes combined, plus three more Lake Eries for good measure. Its shoreline runs for over 4,000 kilometers, longer than the coasts of many nations. The scale is difficult to grasp. A single inch of rise across its surface demands over 500 billion gallons of water. This is 10% of all the surface fresh water on Earth, gathered in one colossal basin. Here, geography is not a backdrop, it is the main event. The sheer immensity of this inland sea shapes everything that touches its edge, from weather to memory, and sets the stage for a story measured not in years, but in eons. More than one billion years ago, the ground beneath Lake Superior split open. This was the Mid-Continent Rift, an ancient wound stretching for 2,000 kilometers across North America. Molten rock surged upward from deep inside the Earth, erupting again and again over nearly 20 million years. The lava cooled into dense, dark basalt, layer upon layer, forming the bedrock that now lies beneath the lake's waters. In places, this volcanic rock reaches depths of more than 30 kilometers, a thickness rivaling the world's largest flood basalt fields. The rift's immense pull caused the crust to sag, creating a basin that would one day cradle the largest freshwater lake on the planet. Dr. John Green, a geologist with the United States Geological Survey, says, The mid-continent rift is like a scar deep in the continent, a failed attempt to tear North America in two. The rocks beneath Lake Superior record a story of fire, stretching and collapse, on a scale that is hard to imagine. The rift's volcanic legacy set the blueprint for everything that followed, establishing the contours of the basin long before ice ever touched its edges. 20,000 years ago, the heart of the continent lay buried beneath a moving wall of ice. The Laurentide ice sheet, kilometers thick, advanced and retreated across the ancient rift basin, grinding rock, deepening valleys, and reshaping the land with every pass. Glacial ice scoured the volcanic floor, carving through weaknesses in the basalt and dragging boulders like a sculptor's chisel. Where the ice pressed hardest, it gouged the basin deeper, leaving behind underwater valleys and abrupt cliffs that now rise like cathedral walls above the shoreline. Along the North Shore, these cliffs stand as silent witnesses, sheer faces of stone, streaked and striated, the handiwork of a force measured in millennia. As the glaciers melted and withdrew, meltwater filled the newly hollowed basin giving birth to the vast inland sea. 
the final retreat of the ice about 10,000 years ago revealed a landscape transformed, a fusion of volcanic bedrock and glacial artistry where every headland and bay carries the memory of ancient ice. Here, the work of fire was completed by the hand of ice, setting the stage for a freshwater world unlike any other. Cold air sweeps across Superior's open water, picking up moisture and warmth that the land has already surrendered to winter. As these winds move east and south, they cool again, forcing that moisture to fall as snow, sometimes in bands stretching dozens of kilometers, sometimes in totals that bury towns for weeks. This is lake effect snow, a phenomenon that turns the shoreline into a snow belt and transforms the lake into a weather machine. In places like Houghton, Michigan, annual snowfall can top 200 inches, much of it delivered by snow-laden clouds rolling um, off the water. The key is Superior's immense fetch. The uninterrupted distance wind can travel across the lake's surface. Here, that fetch stretches up to 350 kilometers, giving storms time and space to build force. When winds align with the lake's longest axis, the result is waves that can reach 10 meters high, rivaling the open Atlantic. Modern weather buoys have recorded wave heights over 9 meters during autumn gales, enough to test even the largest ore carriers. In summer, the same thermal mass that fuels winter storms tempers the heat, keeping nearby forests and towns cooler than those farther inland. Superior does not just sit on the map. It shapes the climate of an entire region, its influence felt in every snowstorm, breeze, and breaking wave. Lake Superior's shoreline stretches for more than 4,000 kilometers, curving through rugged headlands, sweeping bays, and islands scattered like stepping stones across the water. Along the north, basalt cliffs rise abruptly from the lake. Remnants of ancient lava flows now battered by wind and wave. To the south and east, sandy beaches and forested bluffs mark the passage from wild coast to settled land. For millennia, these shores have offered both shelter and challenge, a place where human history is etched into stone and memory. The Ojibwe people have called this place home for centuries. Their name for the lake, Gichigami, means the Great Water. Elder Dorothy Goki says that when the Ojibwe say Gichigami, they speak of a being, not just a lake. It is alive, and we are part of its story. The Ojibwe mapped Superior's moods and seasons long before European arrival, reading the clouds, the ice, and the changing winds. Their stories and songs still echo along the shoreline, carried by the same breezes that shape the waves. Beneath the forests and cliffs, copper veins run through the bedrock. Thousands of years ago, indigenous miners dug pits into the Kowina Peninsula, extracting pure copper with stone tools and fire. These ancient pits, some stretching 30 feet deep, mark one of the oldest known mining traditions in North America. Later, industrial mines transformed the landscape, but the copper story begins with the people who first shaped it here, on the edge of Gichigami. The lake's coast is more than a boundary. It is a living archive, holding the memory of every hand that has touched its stones. On November 10, 1975, the steamship Edmund Fitzgerald vanished from radar in a storm that swept across the eastern basin of Lake Superior. The ship's final position, 46 degrees, 59 minutes north, 85 degrees, 7 minutes west, lies beneath 162 meters of water, 17 miles from Whitefish Point. 
all 29 crew members were lost. In the aftermath, search teams used sonar to scan the lake bed, revealing the Fitzgerald split in two, preserved in the lake's frigid depths. Superior's cold, nearly oxygen-free water halts decay, leaving the wreck almost untouched by time. Every year, the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum curator reviews sonar images and artifacts and remarks that the lake keeps its secrets. Down there, history does not fade. It waits. The Fitzgerald is not alone. Hundreds of vessels rest on Superior's floor, their stories frozen in the dark. Here, the lake's geography is a force that does not forgive and its cold depth is both a grave and a vault, holding memory in perfect stillness. The ground beneath Superior is still in motion. Along the northern shore, the crust rises by a few millimeters each year, a slow rebound from the weight of glaciers that vanished 10,000 years ago. This ongoing uplift is tracked by Global Navigation Satellite System Stations, which record the land's subtle ascent year after year. In places near Thunder Bay and Duluth, scientists have measured a total rise of more than 20 centimeters over the last century. The basin itself is not fixed. It breathes in geological time, reshaping coastlines and shifting the balance of water and land. Superior's water moves through its own cycle as well. Every drop that enters the lake, whether from rain, snowmelt, or river, will remain for nearly two centuries before flowing out through the St. Mary's River. Hydrologists at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory describe this as a residence time of about 200 years. Dr. Mark Rowe, a hydrologist there, puts it simply, Lake Superior filters itself so slowly that the water you see today is the same water your great-grandchildren will see. This immense stability is both a gift and a responsibility, linking generations through a system that changes at the pace of stone and sky. Today, as climate shifts and fresh water grows scarce, Lake Superior's 10% share of the world's surface fresh water stands as a planetary reserve. Its stability shapes regional weather, economies, and ecosystems. The question is not its endurance, but ours, in learning to live within nature's epic scale. Thanks for watching.